morning everyone welcome to midway let's stand together and we're going to sing some songs together as we get started in our worship service today we're going to sing this song we've been working on for a couple of weeks now indescribable and uh, it's about the goodness of the lord and the power and the majesty of our creator so sing this song with us here this morning indescribable sing another song about our amazing God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. This uh, song number in your hymnal there, if you'd like to follow along with the sheet music, is on the screen there. And let's sing this old hymn together. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
church is salt and light. And uh, that's something that we've been praying that God would give us wisdom on how to be better at being salt and light in our community. And we've chosen this song as our theme song, Salt and Light. And uh, sing along with us. Many of you know this, but this is our theme song for 2017. Uh, join in and help us sing this song. Oh, the beauty of the King. faithfulness. If you'll sing that with us there, Hymn 109 in your hymn book. If you want to follow along on the sheet music, Hymn 109, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Aren't you thankful for a faithful God? Not just a great God, but a faithful God. Let's think about that this morning as we sing this song. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow. second verse in that chorus a cappella, and so Heather get us the, the first notes there and let's sing that last verse pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for to Blessings all mine with 
10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. out our song time this morning. Let's sing, Lord, I need you. And as we get closer to our time of, uh, of, of Bible teaching, Bible preaching this morning, think about the words of this song. Lord, I need you. May that be your commitment and my commitment this morning. May that be our prayer today. Lord, we need you. We need you in our lives. We need you as our good shepherd. And so think about that as we sing this song this morning. Lord, I come. I confess. Midway Baptist Church, and thank you for the good singing this morning. I really believe God is pleased with the songs and the hearts of the people that are here this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of this service this morning, and uh, we're looking forward to what God has for us today. And uh, as you're standing there, let's pray, and we'll ask God to bless our service as we begin here this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for your love in our lives. We thank you for the uh, just the, the goodness of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for giving us something to sing about. And Lord, uh, the those around us in our community who do not know you. They don't know the joy. They don't know the, the, the passion that comes from knowing Jesus Christ, the excitement for living that comes from a relationship with you. And Lord, help us to be that song, to be that message, to share the truth of Jesus Christ with those around us. And Lord, as we come together in your house today to worship you, I pray that you would be pleased with everything that happens, that Jesus would be lifted up, that he would be made known and exalted here today. It's not about us, Lord. It's about him. 
We didn't come here to serve ourselves. We didn't come here to serve uh, our own interests. We came here to serve you and to honor you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be uh, pleased with all that goes on. Be with the preaching that comes in just a few moments. Be with our time of communion uh, at the close of the service. And, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would visit with us now. May your Holy Spirit touch hearts and touch lives here today. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated there. And as you're seated, kids, we're going to dismiss for Children's Church this morning. Um, if you're sixth grade or under here this morning, Brother Jimmy's got a lesson uh, from the Bible here for you today. If you'll hop up there and uh, join him, and uh, we'll have our, uh, our children's service this morning. Psalm 23 is where we're going to be today. Uh, if you'll turn there with me here in the auditorium, those of us that are left behind, Psalm 23. We're going to start our reading in verse number one, and we're continuing this series of messages um, on Psalm 23 and the Lord's uh, closeness with us, the Lord's uh, shepherding over our lives, His guidance over our lives. And it's a very interesting verse that we're coming to here today. This is a verse that's been used many times uh, by the Lord to, to help people through some very difficult uh, seasons of life, uh, death in the family, uh, loss of uh, something that is deeply loved and cherished. And so uh, today as we focus on this, I want us just to take a few minutes here and really dig down into this verse and try to understand why this verse is here for us today. But Psalm 23, let's begin our reading in verse number 1. Psalm 23 and verse number 1. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look in verse number 4 there where David writes, as the sheep, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so we're going to focus on this idea this morning of never afraid. Never afraid. Let's pray together, and we'll ask God to help us as we study here this morning. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the great love of Jesus Christ that he would not only uh, create us, but that he would have a plan to save us from our sins and to forgive us. And Lord, not only to forgive us, but to lead us in our lives and to be ever present with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we think this morning about the shepherding work of Jesus Christ, I pray that you would just arrest our attention for a few moments. Lord, whatever it is that's keeping us from being close to you, Lord, whatever it is that's uh, keeping us from uh, having our hearts fully engaged this morning. Lord, may we just lay that at the foot of the cross and give it to you. Lord, you tell us to come and uh, come, unto all, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And so, Lord, this morning for that person that's carrying a heavy burden with them today, Lord, I pray that they lay that at your feet and give it over to you and find the comfort and the rest that comes from Jesus Christ. Lord, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have cable uh, television, uh, but I do understand that this week is the Discovery Channel Shark Week. Everybody heard about that? This is apparently Shark Week starting up uh, with the Discovery Channel. And for some reason, after all these years, Shark Week is still a big deal. You know, I remember when I was a kid, that was a big thing. Shark Week's coming and nothing but nonstop programming about sharks. And that's still, for some reason, a big moneymaker uh, for the Discovery Channel. Uh, why do we care that much about sharks? Why are we so enthralled with these intimidating creatures? I mean, think about Jaws. When it came out in 1975, what a phenomenon that was. And people were terrified to go in the, in, in, at, to the beach and get in the water for uh, quite a while after Jaws came out. And then Jaws 2 came out. And, you know, just we have this thing about sharks and these intimidating creatures. And not just sharks, obviously, but other things as well. We have this, um, this impression from them. 
But think about this. Is it possible that we're so impressed by these creatures because we're just the tiniest bit afraid of them? You know, we, we enjoy watching them on television, but we would not enjoy being that close to them if we were in the water, right? We're just a tiny bit afraid of them and impressed by their power and by their magnificence and also their ability to destroy, to, to bring carnage into things. I mean, imagine how quickly if you were swimming out in Lake Thunderhead and somebody put a shark out in, in Lake Thunderhead. And by the way, there are freshwater sharks. Uh, the bull shark can actually live in freshwater and in saltwater. So imagine how terrifying that would be if somebody decided they were going to play a prank and throw a shark out in Lake Thunderhead. We wouldn't go out there anymore, would we, until somebody took care of that problem. Why? Because we're a little bit afraid of them. We're fearful of them because of what they could do to us. Fear is something that we carry with us all the time, even when we don't think about it. It's something that is an innate reaction within us. It's something that I would even submit that God built into us to help us know when danger is coming. We talked about this at the beginning of the year with that series of messages on new fears resolutions. And uh, if you missed that, go back to that. I, I won't rehash all of that, but go back to our, uh, our website and our um, YouTube page and all that stuff and listen to those again. Again, and remind yourself of the fact that fear was put by God into us so that we wouldn't do things that are dangerous, so that we wouldn't uh, walk off the edge of a cliff without realizing that that could hurt me. God built a self-preservation within me. But sometimes we take that too far, don't we? We don't go swimming with sharks because we know that that could be dangerous. And at least I bet there's somebody in this room that would go swimming with sharks, but uh, most of us would not do that because we recognize that as dangerous. That could be a life-stopping activity. But then there are other things that we're afraid of that are not necessarily as dangerous as we consider them to be in our minds. But yet we have a fear reaction when we see them, when we think about them. And I'm not just talking about heights and snakes and tight spaces. I'm talking about life situations. Sometimes we have this reaction of fearfulness that God didn't intend for us, that God didn't didn't intend for us to feel and experience, sometimes we go through those times that are moments of actual legitimate fear, and then sometimes we take it too far. Sometimes we allow our emotions to control us instead of us controlling our emotions. And we're going to talk about that this morning. I want you to notice here that we have just crossed the halfway point of Psalm 23 when we come to verse number 4. And it's at this point in the psalm that the focus of the sheep changes. Up to this point, he's talking about the shepherd. Notice there in verse number one, he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Up to this point, he's talking about the shepherd. In verse number four, the focus changes, and now the sheep actually begins to talk to the shepherd. David changes his focus, he changes his description. Discussion, uh, and now instead of talking to us, the readers, about someone else, he's talking directly to the shepherd. He's locked eyes with his shepherd and beginning to lovingly and thankfully speak to the shepherd about what he's done for his life. So up to this point, this has been a song of thankfulness. David has been expressing thanks to God, to us, for everything that God has done. And now in verse number four, it changes from a song of thankfulness to a prayer. He actually begins to pray and speak to God directly. That's what we mean when we say prayer, isn't it? That we're talking to God. And so David begins to talk to God directly and pray and speak to the Lord. Some of the most powerful thoughts in this psalm are wrapped up in these three verses, in this prayer that David makes. So we're going to move through this, uh, these last three verses carefully. And what is the first thing that David thanks God for? What is the first thing that David says to God? He says, thank you, Lord, for deliverance from fear. Thank you for delivering me from my fearfulness. Middle Eastern shepherds uh, will begin to travel uh, their sheep during the summer 
summer months through the mountains. That's what David's talking about here in verse number 3 when he says that he leads me uh, in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. God is now beginning to work in his life and pull David along just like a shepherd leads a sheep in the summertime. Once it begins to get hot on the plains and the water becomes scarce, the, the, the grass becomes more dried out, the shepherd will begin to lead them up into the mountains where the uh, snow is retreating back and leaving behind it um, fresh grass, flowing streams, things like that. But the way that the shepherd has to take to get them to the place of greenness and provision and food is a dangerous path. It, it can be a very dangerous way to take. But then once the fall approaches, the snow begins to fall again, and the shepherd retreats them off the mountains and back into the plains. So it's kind of the annual cycle of many of the Middle Eastern shepherds. And David says here in verse number four that as we're taking this journey, as we're getting to the mountain, God, sometimes we have to walk through the valleys. You know, before every substantial mountain, before every important move of God in your life and in my life, there's a valley. There's a valley. And sometimes it is the valley of the shadow of death. So let's talk about this valley here this morning. Notice to me, first of all, the reality of the valley. The reality of the valley. Nobody likes um, depressing times in life. Nobody likes difficult seasons in life. Nobody likes darkness in their life when they don't know where the next step is, when the next thing that I'm supposed to do, uh, wh wh where that is. It's in the valley that the shepherd and the sheep know that there are predators. There's lots of places to hide in the valley. There are a lot of dark spaces where the predators can hide and attack the sheep. And so in the valley is where the shepherd has to be his most vigilant. The sheep has to keep his eyes open. And it's a time of uncertainty. It's a time of fear. And to get to that mountain, though, we have to face the reality of the valley. We have to get through the trying times, uh, the, the reality of the valley. But think about this. This valley, David says, is filled with shadow. It's filled with shadow. Uncertainty is just a fact of life. We are all going to face times of uncertainty and times of not knowing what the next step is. You ever wake up sometimes and you just wonder what the next shoe is that's going to drop? You just wonder, you know, I, uh, I'm primed for something. It's, this week has just been not going the way it's supposed to go. What's the next thing that's going to go wrong? You ever felt that way? Uncertainty is just a part of life. Benjamin Franklin, I believe it was, that uh, said that there are only two certain things in life, death and taxes. Everything else is uncertain. You know, we all face times and we just don't know. We just don't know what's going to happen to us next. So how do you deal with uncertainty? How do you deal with the valley of the shadow? How do you do that? Well, the Bible tells us that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The Bible is the only thing that will truly shed light on the dark seasons of life. Now, there are those out there who will try and try to encourage us, and there's nothing wrong with seeking out help and seeking counsel in the dark seasons of life, but we need to understand this, that that counsel is only as good as it lines up with the truth of Scripture. If somebody tells us something that denies what the Bible teaches us and denies the guidance that God is trying to give us, it is false counsel and it is not to be trusted. In fact, that's not shedding light on the situation. It's only making things more dark. It's only making things more difficult, more doubtful, harder to get through. Uh, can I just say this? If you're looking for your counsel from what Dr. Phil has to say or what they say on The View, and that's where you're trying to figure out how to get your path for living, can I tell you this? You're seeking the wrong counsel. You're seeking the wrong counsel. Um, if, if they're not lining up with what God has already provided you in His Word, then you're going to slip. You're going to find yourself stepping in the path of a predator, and God's Word wants to be that lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Now notice the way God describes it. He says it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. What he's talking about here is a lantern. You know, this is not a floodlight. All right, this is not something that illuminates an entire area. A lantern is really just built to provide a stable, reliable light for the next step. 
And it, that's the way God's Word works. God isn't really as interested in providing us counsel for how to live 10 years down the road. He wants to tell us how to take the next step because that's what I'm facing right now. 10 years down the road will take care of itself if I know how to take this step and then the next step and the next step. God's Word is a short light, but it's a reliable light. It'll be there not just for this step, but then the step that I have to take after that and the step that I have to take after that. You know, lightning illuminates an entire area, but it's not very dependable. It's going to provide light for the next step, but then after that, you're on your own. You're in darkness again. God's Word is a consistent, it is a practical and protective light for your feet and for my feet. It'll tell you what to do next. And then when you get there, it can help you take the next step after that. The work that God's doing in all of our lives is a cumulative work, right? Uh, it is not a line that God is just going to tell us this is going to happen today and then five years down the road this is going to happen and ten years down the road this is going to happen, twenty years down the road this is going to happen. We'd like to think that we're moving in that direction and maybe we can start to, to read things and understand uh, where our life is progressing. But you know as well as I do that you could wake up tomorrow and go to the doctor's office and your entire plan for your life could be derailed just like that. All it takes is the C word, cancer, and your whole next six months, year, five years, who knows, your entire life course may change in just a moment because God doesn't give us light all the way down the line of light. But it is cumulative. It builds upon itself. God is going to teach you and me through His Word, through the wisdom of others, through the counsel that we get that is wise, that lines up with the Word of God. We will take the next step. And then God will show us what's coming after that. This is what you need to do to take the next step. And then as we take that step, He then shows us the next thing to do. And what He's doing is He's building upon our lives. He's teaching us all along along the way of how to deal with this problem. And then once we've learned how to deal with that problem, He gives us the light for how to deal with the next problem. And what He's doing is He's building and He's teaching and He's instructing us. Why? So that we can be more like Christ. So that we can be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if all I knew how to do was to navigate that one little line of what to do five years down the road and ten years and twenty years down the road, if, that's, uh, if I had all of that information, I would never learn how to be like Christ. I would just learn how to live my life well. But by taking this step, whatever it is, whether it's this direction or this direction, or sometimes God takes, makes us take a little step back sometimes, doesn't He? He says, you're getting a little close to the water. You're getting a little close to that predator. You need to back up just a little bit. Even in those moments, what God is doing is He's teaching me not just how to take steps. He's teaching me character. And He's teaching you character. He's teaching us not just good, uh, how to be a good citizen or how to be a a good person. He's teaching us how to be like Jesus. He's taking the character of Jesus Christ and he's putting it into our lives and he's molding us and shaping us to think, act, and be like Jesus Christ. Remember we talked about that in the last half of last year. We talked about the, the ten characteristics, the ten thought processes of Jesus, the ten behaviors of Jesus, and the ten character uh, traits of Jesus Christ. We talked about how that molds us. Once we start thinking that way and acting that way and just being that way, we become like Jesus Christ. That's what God's trying to do in all of our lives through every step, through every uh, motion that we make in life. That's what God's trying to do. This valley is a valley of shadow. But I want you to think about this. It brings the fear of death. He says here, this is the valley of the shadow of death. Right? This is an intimidating place to be. This is a scary place to be because once we enter it, we think we're never going to get out of it. This is it. This is the end. This is as far as my life is going. This is as far as I'm going to progress in life. I've hit the end. I've hit the wall. There's nowhere else for me to go. You know, death is a kind of loss, isn't it? It's the loss of life. 
And that's what makes it so fearful for us is we're losing something and we're losing the worst thing to lose. We're losing our lives. There is nothing more that we can do. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, once you go in the ground, your life is over. There's no more going back and changing things. There's no more uh, progressing uh, with life any further. Your chances are done and over with. I was talking with somebody about the, this week. We are talking about ghosts and spirits and things like that and whether they uh, truly are disembodied people just moving around this earth. And this person referenced Ecclesiastes and said, you know, well, the Bible says that, you know, once your life is over, it's over. There's no going back and changing things. There's no going back and, you know, making it all work out in the end. And it's true. Death is the end of all of that. It's the end of our opportunity to make a life for ourselves. And can I just tell you this? I would submit to you that our fear of losing something is the number one fear that we all have to face. The majority of our other fears are tied to this fear of losing something. This fear of something dying in our lives and us losing something. Why are most people afraid to go into Chicago, Illinois at, at, at 11 p.m.? You know, why are they afraid to go into the worst part of Chicago at 11 p.m.? Because they're afraid it's the valley of the shadow of death, right? I mean, there's a fear that I might lose my life. This might be the end for me, all right? Why are most people afraid to jump out of an airplane? Because they're afraid that that parachute might not have been packed as well as they were hoping it was. And that, um, there, you know, it's not the fear of falling that I have. It's the sudden stop at the bottom that I'm afraid of. Um, and why, But let me ask you this. We know why we're afraid to jump out of an airplane. We know why we're afraid to just, you know, run around Chicago in the, in the worst part of the night. But why are we so afraid of losing our job? Why are you so afraid of that? Why does the thought of that bring fear into your heart? Because you are afraid of what else you might lose, right? You might lose some material possessions. You might lose your house. You might lose some things that you consider staples of life, important things in life. You're afraid of losing a job because you're afraid of what else might die in your life. What else might be lost in your life? Why are you afraid of going to the dentist? Because you're afraid of blood loss, right? You're afraid of losing some blood and some teeth and things like that. Uh, we, we all are afraid of some things. Why are you afraid of spiders? You know, it's amazing to me. My wife can uh, do all kinds of things to primp and get herself clean. She'll go to the, uh, the, the doctor, or not the doctor, um, it's almost like surgery, but she'll go to the hairstylist and let them take tweezers and wax and things like that and pull things out of her face, pull, eye, pull those eyebrow hairs out of her face and wax her eyebrows. Don't laugh, ladies, you do it too, all right? <laughs> She'll let him do that stuff. But if she sees a little tiny spider, you know, it's panic time, you know. Actually, she's pretty good with spiders. That's, that's cockroaches, though. That's a whole other story altogether. But why are we afraid of things? You're, you're afraid of something, too, whether it's snakes or spiders or bees or wasps or something like that. We're all afraid of those things. Why are we afraid of those things? Because if you get stung or you get bit, you're afraid of the pain that results because pain is a loss of happiness. It's a loss of peace. Now my now I've got this hurt going on in my body. I've got this thing I got to deal with, um, and you know we're afraid of those things. If we were still living back in the Garden of Eden where there was no violence, there was no bee stings, there was no spider bites, you wouldn't be afraid of them, and I wouldn't be afraid of them either. We're afraid of the damage that they can create in our lives. So I would submit to you that the majority. I'm not going to say 100 percent, but the vast majority of the things that we are afraid of, we are afraid of them because of what we might lose as a result of that. It's not that we're afraid of that thing so much as what that thing might cause in my life, the hurt, the decay, the pain that that might create in my life. So as we think about that, let's move to our next thought. David's progressing along here. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
David, how can you say that? How can you say, I will fear no evil? Don't you know what life is like? Don't you know that life is complicated? Life is painful? Life brings hurt. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble, Job said. How can you say that, that you will fear no evil? What kind of faith it takes to be able to say that? Here's David's reply to that. He says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I know that the shepherd is there. I know that the shepherd is nearby. And even though we're going into a dark place, a place where I'm afraid of losing something, I'm afraid of even losing my life in this dark and lonely place, the shepherd is there. I have to go through that valley. I have to go into that valley. Why? Because that is where the shepherd's going to meet me. That's where the shepherd is going to find me and lead me through the valley of the shadow of death. This valley brings the fear of loss. It brings the fear of death. But it also leads us to trust the shepherd. It leads us to trust the shepherd in a greater way. Go over to John chapter 10. I want you to look at this with me. John chapter 10, Jesus speaks to his disciples, his followers. And he says here in verse 11 of John chapter 10, in verse 11, John chapter 10 and verse 11. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus talks about a hireling here. A hireling was somebody who didn't own the sheep, but they were hired on by the master shepherd, the real owner of the sheep. They were hired on to care for the sheep and look after the sheep. Jesus says the problem with hirelings is they don't have any real skin in the game. They don't have any real intimacy or care for the sheep. They're just drawing a paycheck. And so when the trouble comes, when danger comes, the problem with hirelings is that a lot of times they'll flee. They'll run away trying to save their own neck rather than looking out for the, the care of the sheep and looking out for their problems and their needs. Jesus says, he's not a hireling. He says, that's not his role. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am not just some hireling brought on to perform some work and then I'm just going to abandon you. He says, I have bought you with my own blood. I have bought you with my own death on the cross. I am connected with you. I've paid a great price for you. And since I've got skin in the game, since I've got real connection here, I'm looking out for you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. When the wolf comes and tries to scatter the sheep, he says, I'll be there. When the predator attacks, I'll be there. Why? He says, I will lay down my life for the sheep. Can I just submit this to you? Your ability to trust God in the dark times of life doesn't say so much about God as it says about your perspective of who he is. Let me explain that for a minute. If you're unable to trust God in the dark times of life, and I'll throw this on myself, if I'm unable to trust God in the dark, in the lonely times of life, it says not that God is not worthy of being trusted. It says that I'm thinking of Christ more as a hireling than as the good shepherd. That I don't think he's dependable. That I don't think he's trustworthy. But can I say this? He's already proven himself. He's already proven himself to be worthwhile. He's already proven himself to be trustworthy. He went all the way to the cross and shed his innocent blood, not for himself, not for the crimes that he committed, but for the crimes that you and I committed. 
so that he could buy us to himself. He purchased us with his own blood, the Apostle Paul said. Jesus has proven himself to be trustworthy. And so if you and I can't trust him, it doesn't say, it doesn't disqualify him from actually being trustworthy. It just shows that we're thinking of Jesus more as a hireling than truly as the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thou art with me. It leads us to trust our shepherd. I want you to think about this. There's something wonderful about this shepherd that we don't often consider. But Jesus doesn't protect us from loss. That's never been guaranteed in the Bible. God never promised that the day that you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ that everything would just go swimmingly for the rest of life. There would be no more problems. All the bills would get paid on time. No more issues. Never have to work another day in your life. Everything's just hunky-dory. God never said that. He never promised to protect you from loss because loss is a part of life. But ultimately, one day, He is going to repay all of your losses. Everything that you and I stand to lose in this life, we regain in heaven. Everything that you and I lose, whether it's death or uh, financial stability or family or something like that, we regain in heaven. We get it all back, and in a greater way than we ever had it before. The life that we live in heaven is so much better than the life that we live down here. The family members that we love and we care about today that are passing away that will one day lose to heaven, they'll be in such better condition. The cancer will be gone. The emphysema will be gone. The COPD, the arthritis, all that's going to be blotted away, and we'll know them as they want once were, and even better than they once were. God repays all of that. Rather than let us sit the rest of eternity in a state of losing this and losing that and experiencing that loss, ultimately through faith in Jesus Christ, once a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, you get to gain, but you don't get to decide the day that you gain. We don't get to decide the days that we lose, and we don't get to decide the days that we gain. But the day of gain is coming. What the Apostle Paul say that uh, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Heaven is waiting for us out there. Every believer that is living today that has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, heaven is just on the horizon. We don't know when we're going to reach it. We don't know when we're going to get to that mountaintop. And we're going to have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death to get there. But it is there. It is waiting for us. And because of that, we can trust. We can hold on. We can endure. Notice this with me. It leads us to our final thought about the valley. It isn't permanent. It isn't permanent. Notice how David describes it here in verse number 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Many times we think that we're just walking to the valley of the shadow of death. And that's where the journey is going to end. This will be the end for me. I'm done for. It's over. My family is going to fall apart. My career, my financial stability, it's all just going to disappear. Every piece of joy that I've ever had is going to stop once I hit this problem. Once I hit this obstacle. But David says it this way. You're going to walk me through the valley of the shadow of death. The problems that we face in this life, the things that we experience that are scary to us, is not a permanent fixture for us. Now, there are some valleys that are scarier than others, and there are some valleys that are more final than others. Some people will walk into the valley of the shadow of death, and they will not walk out the other side the way they came in. We are all going to have to walk through the door of death one day. Unless Jesus Christ comes back and returns and raptures us home to be, to heaven, be in heaven with Him forever, we're waiting for that day. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Unless that happens, we're all going to have to walk through that final valley of death. And not just the shadow of death, but the certainty of death. But can I say that? Say this, that even that valley isn't permanent. 
that there's a mountaintop on the other side that is glorious and beautiful and bright. And to get to that mountain that we call heaven, you have to pass through the valley of death. But it is not permanent. There is something waiting for us on the other side. Have you ever considered that death isn't really dying for a believer? Death isn't really dying. All it is is we stop living here and we start living in heaven. We stop living in, stop breathing earth's air and we start breathing heaven's air. It's a change. Now, it is death in the sense that we're separated. That's what the Bible means when it talks about death. It's a separation from something. We'll be separated from this world. We'll be separated from this life. We'll be separated from those that are here on this earth. But we will change positions. We will change places. Even death itself isn't permanent. We will all walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to think about this with me before we finish up this morning. Notice what David says here at the end of the verse. He says, Thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. Let's talk about these tools that the shepherd uses, the good shepherd uses. He says, first of all, you've got a rod in your hand to protect me with. The rod was a weapon that the shepherd would use. It was often a sapling tree that would be dug out of the ground and right where the, the roots join up with the, the, the actual trunk of the sapling, they would would cut off the, the tree there, and they would round off that, that ball, that bulb at the bottom of that tree, and they round it off and harden it, and they would actually shape it to the hand of the shepherd. And boys, shepherd boys, would train for weeks and months on end to get proficient at throwing that rod and hitting with that rod, and sometimes they would have to use it to move the sheep around a little bit, put, give them a little bit of incentive to go where they're supposed to go, but ultimately it was for the protection of the sheep. They would use that rod to strike at predators, to strike at animals uh, that would try to get into the flock. Philip Keller, who wrote that book, um, the, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, he talks about one of his experiences as a shepherd where they were up on a, up on a mountain in Africa, and he was there with this little shepherd boy, just this young kid, and they were, they were looking down on this valley where there were elephants migrating through, and they wanted to get the elephants moving, so they pushed a boulder off the side of this cliff and was trying to get the elephants to move off. And as they did it, they unrooted some other rocks and trees and a cobra came out, coiled and ready to strike. And he said that that boy, without even a thought, struck at that cobra and killed him instantly. That's how proficient they get at using those rods. And that's the picture that David uses here to describe the protection of God in our lives. That when God strikes at what's trying to destroy us, He never Never misses the mark. He will hit his mark. He has a rod in his hand that is not meant to destroy us. It is meant to protect us. I want you to think back a little bit further in the Old Testament to one of the first pictures of the rod. And it's called the rod of God. The rod of God. Do you remember who held in his hand the rod of God? His name was Moses. Moses, the leader of the children of Israel uh, out of the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 20 and verse 21, that's the first time it's called the rod of God. And uh, Moses is going into Pharaoh, the, the, the emperor of Egypt. He's going into his palace and he's going to tell Pharaoh, you need to break my people out of slavery. You need to break every chain that's on them and you need to release them because God Jehovah has said to. And to prove that he really was from God, that it was Almighty God that had sent Moses, he used that rod in his hand. You remember, first of all, he threw that rod down on the ground in front of Pharaoh, and the Bible says it turned into a serpent. It transitioned. And then he reached down and he grabbed it by the tail and picked it up, and it immediately became a rod again. And it was that same rod that Moses used when Pharaoh came out to the Nile River one morning to bathe, and Moses came out and he stood by the, the, the side of that river and uh, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh saw him standing there. It was that same rod that Moses held out into the water and it immediately turned into blood, turned the entire Nile River into blood. It was that rod of God that God was using through Moses to convince Pharaoh of some things. 
to convince Pharaoh of just how wrong he was and just how off base he was and how he needed to change his heart, how he needed to change his way of thinking. And later on in the book of Exodus, we find the children of Israel have been released from Egypt. They go into the wilderness, and there in the wilderness, they're fighting a battle. The, the, they're called the Amalekites. Their enemies come against them and come and they uh, strike against the Israelites. And the Bible there again refers to Moses' rod as the rod of God. And Moses sits upon a rock, this big boulder, and every time he holds his arm up with the rod of God in his hand, the Israelites begin to defeat the Amalekites. But like anybody, and especially as an older man, Moses' arm got tired, and he began to drop that rod. It began to sink down, and when he, his hand sank down, the Amalekites would begin to win. The battle would turn against the Israelites. So the Bible says that there were two men, Aaron and Hur, who came up, and they propped him up on that rock, and they held his arms up so that the rod of God could still have the power over the Amalekites that day. And the Israelites won the battle, not because of Moses, not because of Joshua's battle prowess as a general, but because the rod of God was in the man of God's hand. What does the rod of God picture for us? It pictures for us the Bible. It's a picture of the Word of God. It convinces the sinner. It does a work in the heart of the person that needs convincing. And it turns our hearts away from sin, turns our hearts away from our own stubbornness, our own pride, and it convinces us to turn to God's way. And it is also the rod that reassures the follower. It reassures the sheep. It is the rod that shows us that God is not against us, but that God is for us. God is not trying to blot us out in the valley of the shadow of death. He's not trying to destroy us there. He's re going to reassure us of His protection and His safety. The Word of God does that for us. And every time the Bible goes forth, every time the Word of God goes forth, it goes forth with with God's power upon it. The Bible says that it will not return to God void, but it will accomplish the purpose whereunto he sent it. When the Word of God is preached, when the Word of God is read, when you talk to that coworker, when you talk to that family member, and you share the Word of God with them, it will not return void. It will do a work. Now God decides what that work is going to be, and that person has a stake in it as well. But ultimately, you're just doing the job of sending forth the rod, holding the rod up. And so let's keep holding the rod of God forward. Let's keep holding God's power forward. Because every time we begin to see the Bible sink in our society, every time we begin to see the Bible lowered in our culture, the enemy begins to win. The enemy gets uh, influence, further strength upon us. Let's hold the Bible forth. Let's hold the rod in our hands, unashamed, unafraid. Let's prop each other up and hold up the hands that hang down. That actually wasn't in the sermon notes this morning. That was extra, so you don't have to add anything to the tithe this morning to, for that, but just wanted to share that with you. The rod and then the staff. Let's talk about the staff quickly. The rod was a hardened stick, that was just a sapling that was used for protection. The staff was a longer stick that often had a crook in it, a shepherd's crook, or it would have a 90 degree angle in it or something like that. And it was intended to catch the sheep or to kind of move the sheep along. A lot of times sheep, um, newborn, <clears throat> newborn lambs would, uh, would kind of get away, will get away from their, uh, their ewes, their moms. And so rather than touch that little lamb, because now if the shepherd touches that lamb, his smell is going to be upon that little lamb and the mother might reject the sheep. So what he'll do is he'll take that stick and he'll just kind of nudge that with that staff, that little lamb back to her mother so that they can bond with each other. Uh, sometimes sheep will get out of line and uh, they, they start wandering off and the shepherd gives them a little push with that stick, gives them a little nudge back in there to direct their steps and get them in the direction they're supposed to be going. And sometimes it is a lifesaver. 
There are times when a sheep who, we've talked about it before, they're just dumb animals. They just don't have a lot of sense, and they can't see very well, and so they do things that are dangerous. Sometimes a sheep <clears throat> falls into a crevice on a mountain that he can't get out of, and if the shepherd doesn't get him, he'll die. What do they use? They reach down with that staff, and they use that crook to pull that sheep up where they can grab them and pull them. Uh, Philip Keller, again, we were talking about him earlier. He talks about an experience where <clears throat> a shepherd lost his sheep in, in a rushing, uh, rapid river. And the only way that that shepherd could get that sheep out was to reach in with his staff and catch him. And he spent hours trying to pull that sheep to himself. He'd catch him and then he'd pull and he'd come off and he'd have to catch him again and pull him and just that, that cycle over and over again. But he eventually saved the sheep from the rapid river. You know, God has some staffs for our lives as well, doesn't he? He has some sticks that he uses to guide us, to direct us, and to protect us from what's out there. Can I just encourage you with this thought? Whatever rod and whatever staff God is using in your life right now, let him use it. Let him use it. He's not trying to hurt you with it. He's trying to guide you through the valley of the shadow of death. If you're unsubmissive to God's rod and his staff now on the plains or on the mountaintops, can I tell you this? It's not going to provide you any extra comfort when you get down in the valley either. You'll be even less submissive to it in the times of trial, in the times of difficulty. Where do hardened atheists come from? How does that happen? You know, there are a lot of militant, hardcore atheists who began as very religious people. Now, notice I didn't say believers. I said religious people, because believers don't turn against their shepherd. But mi militant atheists many times have church backgrounds. They have moms and dads that love God and pray, and they're people of faith and people of trust in Christ even. But these religious children many times will run off in another direction and become the most hardened and militant atheists out there. I had a conversation with one just this week. Where does that come from? How does that happen? Can I say this in many times, and I'm not painting with a broad brush here, it's true of every situation, but in many of the cases that I have seen and heard of, it usually starts with the valley of the shadow of death. They rebelled against the rod and the staff of God, trying to lead them through a time of difficulty. And it was there in the valley of the shadow of death <clears throat> that they said, Jesus isn't the good shepherd. He's just a hireling. I can't trust him. I'm not going to depend on him. And they turn against the shepherd. But you know what the problem is when you do that? Many times you never get out of the valley of the shadow of death. Many of them are stuck there to this day. They can't guide themselves out, and now they're open to predators. Their lives are in danger. Their hearts have been sucked away from the truth, and they're stuck in shadow. They're stuck in darkness because they rebelled against the rod and the staff of God. When God's presence comes, he brings his rod and he brings his staff. There's no getting away from it. We have to take God for who he is. But can I tell you this, when we get into the valley of the shadow of death, if we will learn to trust and appreciate the rod and the staff of God now, once we enter that valley of darkness, that valley of loneliness, we'll be so much more thankful that God did bring his rod and he did bring his staff. Can we pray together? Let's bow our heads and our hearts before God this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning and I ask you to help us now. <coughs> As we close today, Lord, I think about in my own heart the many times that I haven't been as trusting as I should. I haven't depended on you like I should. God, I've been very selfish and self-willed. I haven't submitted to your rod. I haven't submitted to your staff. I've tried to find my own way, my own process. And Lord, I can tell you, and you know this, Lord, that many times I've been frustrated because of it. I've been damaged because of it. Lord, I pray that whoever's here this morning that needed this message, I pray that they would make the commitment even now that when the difficult times come, they will not rebel against the rod. They will not, uh, they, they will not push against it, but they will surrender to the staff. 
They will let you lead. They will let you guide in their lives, regardless of how comfortable it is or how uncomfortable it is. God bless us now in this time of invitation, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed here this morning, if you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. And I can tell you why from the Bible. If that's your testimony today, you know you're on your way to heaven. Would you just slip your hand up there? Just want to uh, offer up a testimony of praise this morning to the Lord. Amen. You can put your hands down there. If you were unable to raise your hand today, can I tell you this? God wants you to know. And we'd love to help you know. We can take the Bible this morning and show you what the Bible says about becoming a true follower of Jesus Christ. That's what God's after. He's not after religious people. He's not after tithers. He's after true followers of Him. We'd love to take the Bible today and show you what that means. So when the time of invitation begins, if God has spoken to your heart about that, would you come forward? Just get my attention. And we'll take the Word of God and show you that today. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. But the fact is, is... I've been doing some rebelling against God's instruments in my life. I've been pushing back against that rod. I've been pushing back against that staff. And God has made me aware of that today. And I want to, I want to get that right. I want to trust God. I want to submit to Him as my shepherd. If that's your testimony today, would you just slip your hand up there? I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Our um, ensemble this morning has a song of invitation. Here's my heart, Lord. And as they sing this song, you can look this way at the words on the screen or you can uh, do business with God in your seat. But if God's dealing with you, I'd invite you to come to this altar and let God deal with you here. Make this a milestone in your life, a marker in your life, that today was the day that you turned, that something changed in your life, something changed in your heart. You gave something to God that you never gave Him before to set a milestone today. That's what this altar is here for. If God's spoken to your heart, would you come? for just a minute as we prepare.